And the Lord be with you. A reading of the Holy Gospel according to John. Now, now many of, of Jesus' disciples who were listening said, well, this, this saying is hard. Uh, who can accept it? Now, since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, does, does, does this shock you? Well, what, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, while sarks, the flesh, is of no avail. Now, the words I have spoken to you are our spirit and life, but there are some among you who, who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And so he said, it is for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to them by my Father. And as a result of this, many of his disciples left and returned to their former way of life. And they no longer followed Jesus. Jesus then turned and said to the twelve, do you, do, you, do you also want to leave? It was Simon Peter who answered, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Christ, the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. And uh, if you wouldn't mind whispering a little prayer that I can do this properly because today the, the scriptures basically demand that we address uh, not the elephant in the room, but the, the dinosaur in the room. And the question for us is, is the dinosaur going to go extinct or can there be a change? And of course, you know, wherever I speak, I speak of the great scandal that has come up in the church again, again. And the scriptures tell us, especially in that beautiful reading from Ephesians, where, where, where we are told that, that the bridegroom has married his bride and the bride is the church and he wants his beautiful church to be clear of every stain and of every wrinkle and right now we are besotted. Right now, we are not very clean. And so we are called to at least begin by looking at it. Nothing is ever solved by burying. You never bury anything spiritual dead. Anger, hurt, resentment, anything that you bury. And Jesus says so clearly, you, you, what you are going to be whispering among yourselves is going to be shouted from the rooftop. Everything that is done in secret is now going to be made public. And so it's better to bring it out now, to look at it as best we can. Both the good and the bad. Both this wonderful kingdom, this body of Christ that Jesus proclaims who we are, the people of God, the ecclesia, the gathering, and the institution that has grown up around it that was meant to carry the kingdom, but sometimes got in the way of the kingdom. Now, many of us in this room today came up in the, in the, in the 60s and maybe the early 70s, and it was at that time, those were those are the wonderful, halcyon days of, uh, of the Second Vatican Council. We, we had grown up in a rather stuffy church, and all of a sudden the, the windows were open, and old John the 23rd says, Aggiornamento, and we would sing, Aggiornamento, do away with Trento, Mary in Advento. We, I, we were free. You know, and we were going to get rid of all the things that were keeping us from being the people we wanted to be. And it was incredibly, incredibly liberal. We were, we, Andy Greeley called us the new breed. And, and we believed it. <laughs> and, and so we, 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 uh, we uh, were, were rebelling against the church that never made a mistake. Yeah, I can remember going to Sister Malachi saying one priest said something, the other priest said something else. She says, oh, no, 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 Anthony, you didn't understand. No, no, they never contradict each other. <laughs> Ever. They never make a mistake. 
And I thought, oh, this Holy Mother of the Church stuff, I'm never going to use that. I'm never going to use that Holy Mother of the Church stuff. Yeah, I was, a, I was a baby deacon. My very, very, very first homily at St. Michael's in Wheaton as a baby deacon, I got up and I'm preaching away, and as is my want, I'm away from my notes, and I got stuck, and, and I says, and, and, and Holy Mother of the Church says, <laughs> and I'm going, where did that come from? It came from somebody, someplace really, really deep. I mean, my, my very identity. Holy Mother of the Church gave me my identity as a good little Catholic boy because the world, we know at that time, was divided between the Catholics and the publics, and I was a Catholic. You know, in Chicago, you never, you never asked what streets you lived on or what neighborhood you came from. They asked what parish you're from because the whole world was identified by by who we, there's something wonderful about that. It, it gave us a surety, a security, an identity. We knew who we were, and, and, and it still does. That institution still does. If, if I was not a member of the institutional church and an ordained minister of it, right now I'd be preaching to the wind. We're here, and we're here for a reason. So there's something really good here. But wherever there is light, there's a shadow. And there really is a shadow here, too. And we have to look at the shadow as much as we look at the light because if we don't, the shadow will always cause us to act out in ways that are beyond unhealthy, that are utterly destructive. And, of course, what was the, the shadow side of, of all this wonder and security and Holy Mother of the Church? It was, it was this sense of, of we can't be touched that we are superior, that we have the answer. We have, we have the truth. And if I have the truth, then obviously you don't have the truth. And it was a great place to hide, to hide behind all of the trappings and the rituals and, and, the, and, and the places of respect. And oh, how Jesus loved to look at the Pharisees who loved places of respect in the heads of the table and widening their phylacteries. And he says, you hypocrites. You hypocrites. You are dead man's bones inside of whitened sepulchers. And that's the shadow side. And in that church, if you wanted to be a servant of the church, if you wanted to be a priest in the church, all you needed to do was to go into the seminary and keep your mouth shut. Really, and at the end of, if you started in eighth grade, at the end of eight years or 12 years, you're going to get ordained. With, with no matter what was going on inside or what your motivation was, and I dare say most people didn't even know their motivation, but they knew that this was a safe place to hide. I, I dare say the best place to hide from God is in religion because it looks so good. It looks so righteous. We say the right words. But inside, there is that dark shadow part that just doesn't want to let go. How do we get from this magnificent vision of Jesus, of the kingdom of God, and Paul's magnificent theology of the body of Christ, of the people of God, of the ecclesia, to this monolithic institution that would brook no, brook no, no, no contradiction, that would trample down on anything that would contradict it, well, if you have a charismatic leader, if that message is to go beyond one or two generations, uh, the sociologist Max Weber will tell you that it's got to be routinized. It's got to go into some kind of an institution. You've got to have a carrier of this message. If you're going to have a carrier of this message, then you're going to have to have some people who are official in that and officials in that, and there's going to be some kind of a hierarchy and some kind of a structure and then some kind of a ritual and some kind of teaching. And then pretty soon those things become so strong that, that we sometimes miss the message for all the trappings. And that began, you know, we can pretty much date that to 313 with the Peace of Constantine, when all of a sudden the church, which was no longer the minority report, but now the majority report, it got in bed with the government, it got in bed with the power, and therefore power is always going to protect itself 
and it became that institution, strong institution, old institution. And the first rule of any institution is to keep it going, is to protect itself. Especially if you're making a living off of it, especially if you got some kind of prestige off of it, or if you've got some kind of a, of, of, of a, a higher goodness off of it, you're going to protect it every way that you can. You're going you're to cover up the faults. You don't want to see them. And that goes for every institution. They all cover up. And you would have thought that we may have learned from Nixon or Clinton or, or, or up to where our government is right today that it's never the sin, it's always the cover-up. And it's still the cover-up, isn't it? And every institution, ev let me say it again, every institution covers up. I don't care if it's a religious institution, a secular institution, a political institution, an economic, an educational, a medical, they all participate in cover-ups. All of them, all of them, Catholics, Orthodox Jews, Ohio and Penn State, the NFL, the NFL sometimes is called the League of Denial because there is no way that those concussions came from us. Cover it up. If you cover it up, maybe it'll go away. Throw some of the kind, kind of shiny object out there to, to, to misguide their attention. And if they look at the shiny object, maybe they won't see what's going on inside. Cover it up. Every institution covers it up. How do you change that? And you know, the bigger the institution, the harder it is to change. And we are probably, you know, we're probably one of the few truly global institutions in the world. Global. How, how, do, you, how do you turn this huge battleship around on a dime? It's not going to be done. It's not going to turn around on a dime. It's not going to happen. And somehow we think that we get one insight and then it's all over. That's not going to happen that way. It takes eons. It's going on right now. I can remember in 1980, oh, I think it was the early 80s, 83, 84, when I was working on my doctor with, with, with uh, Jack Shea. And he says, you know, we're going through a tectonic shift right now. Every 500 years, there's a, a major shift. He says, and you know what? You're going to be going through it for the rest of your life because we're turning around. It is a new reformation. We are in the process of being reformed. The question is, in the process of being reformed, are we going to survive the reformation? Or are we going to become just another dinosaur? Dead men's, women's bones. And so it's a, a really profound question. And it's very, very hard to turn around how do you make a dinosaur nimble and quick and, and able to adapt to every situation? It does not happen overnight. It takes a great deal of time. And the only thing that will ultimately move us off the dime is pain. Is pain. You know, when we feel enough pain, when the alcohol, alcoholic feels enough pain, when the uh, gambling addict or the sect addict feels enough pain, they begin to say, I have no control over this situation. And right now, there is a great deal of pain that has been exposed. And the first pain is the pain of the victims. You know, we never looked at the victims. We were so busy protecting the institution. We just wanted to cover up. We wanted to pay them off. We wanted to give them a non-disclosure agreement. And so that pain was buried. It never goes away. It never goes away. You don't bury it dead. And sooner or later, it's got to come out. It's got to be exposed to the light of day. There may be healing once it's exposed, but until it's exposed, nothing's happening. And it takes years. We know now that, now that it has come out that the pain has been real and lives have been destroyed. That's real. 
But the even greater calamity, and, and I think even greater pain, is our looking away. Is our inability to see and say, we screwed up. We made a mistake. Uh, John, uh, um, the, the senator from Arizona, uh, McCain. McCain, died yesterday, and one of the most marvelous things he said was, boy, did I make mistakes. Boy, did I screw up. But, but, but my heart was always for the country. It was always for what I, what, I, what I really wanted to do. We need to say we've screwed up. And it, it has to go to the top. But the top doesn't want to be, really doesn't want to see it. In, 19, in 2008 and 2009, over 9 million lives were destroyed when they People lost their houses and lost their jobs because of the fraud that was taking, care, uh, taking place in the banks. And the greater sin is that not one CEO, not one bank executive went to jail or paid a price. The victims paid the price. They were protected. Our bishops are pretty much in the same situation right now. And the question is, what do they do? What do they do? Now, now, in all honesty, back in the 60s and in the 70s, the advice that the bishops were given by the psychiatrists and the psychologists was, this person can be healed. This person can get better. Send him to the psychiatrist. We'll give him six months. He'll make a good confession. He'll go back and he'll be fine. You can move him on. And of course, we, we later learned that all we were doing was spreading the problem around. All we were doing was multiplying the problem. Th then finally, in, in 2002, they did something about it. And the charter was born. And I dare say between 2002 and the present day, the, the number of accusations has dropped precipitously because I honestly believe that the number of people who are abusing has dropped precipitously as well. It's been exposed. It's come out of the darkness. The next question is, after, 2000 and after 1990, when the, the, the bishops discovered that they were not going to get better, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do with these people who have been damaged beyond repair? And of course, the sad thing, and probably the saddest thing of all, is that you scratch an abuser, you will probably find someone who was abused. And probably the saddest thing about sin is that it makes a victim a sinner. Either we're going to have someone to hand over our pain to, or we're going to pass it on. And it was passed on from generation to generation to generation. And the only way it's ever going to stop is to bring it to light and to have accountability. And I dare say the next group to have accountability are going to be our, our bishops. We need a new model for them. And the Holy Father is in Ireland right now, and, and there's all kinds of accusations flowing around all over the place. And of course, the, the, the rap on him is that he's talking pretty. What's he going to do? I think the Chilean model is not a bad model. I, I really, I mean, it's going to have to take somebody much wiser than myself to know, to set the model that this does, that this does not continue. But we're, we're slow to respond. That knee-jerk reaction is in everyone. The knee-jerk reaction was in the Pope. When he was first told about the Chilean bishops, he says, no, 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 it can't be. I know these people. And then when he saw the facts, he began to come around and then he said, give me your resignations. And then he began to do something concrete about it. Until that happens, we're, we're going nowhere. It has to be brought out. There are going to be those who want to see the dinosaur die. I dare say there is a great deal of hatred right now for the church. And it's public. I, don't, I haven't heard anything positive on the news as to where the church is right now. Nothing, nothing. You know, the church is, there, there are two groups of people in the United States that you can trash with absolute impunity, absolute impunity. One, one is the church. 
and the other is rich people. And if you're a rich Catholic, you're dead in the water. You don't, you don't, you don't have a chance. And, and, they would, and, and of course, their rationale is, look what has happened. From the Crusades to the Inquisition, to ISIS, to Al-Qaeda, to the Rwanda. It doesn't end, and it's all religious-based because my group is better than your group, and I've got the truth and you don't, so I can kill you. And so they were much better off without that, but I don't believe that. And I don't believe that for a moment. If we've ever needed the gospel and ministers of the gospel, we need them now. We need them now. And I dare say 98, 99, 99.5% of the people who are ministering are doing a, a wonderful job, a really good job. You know, I have a saying about, especially about priests, you never need a priest until you need one. And when you need one, no one else will do. When you're dying, you don't need the doctor or the lawyer or the accountant. You need the priest. You need that transition. When you've got that confession that you've got to make that is going to be transformative of your life, you need someone that you can talk to who's going to be able to hear and like a good father confessor, turn your life around. Those are wonderful, wonderful gifts, and they give me optimism. I'm quite optimistic. It, this isn't going to end tomorrow. This is going to go on for a while. We have, to, we have to continue to bring it to the light and bring it to the light and bring it to the light. And when we are able to do that, then there will be, there will be healing slowly, 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 slowly. But there will, there will be healing. And why am I optimistic? And I've been privileged to celebrate with the Wheaton Franciscans for a little over two years now. And I see how you have passed on to the next generation, to the lay generation, the charisms and the gifts that you've had. And they're taking it very seriously and picking up that mantle. I, I look at the young men who are coming into the priesthood today. And they certainly have been vetted a lot better than we were ever vetted. As a matter of fact, they were vetted nine ways to Sunday. And I pray God that they become very, very good priests. And, and I, I always amaze them. I had the chance to talk to the seminarians at the, at the NAC, the North American College in Rome one year. And, and I told them, I said, you're like the 9-11 firemen. When everybody was running out of the buildings that were collapsing, they were running into them. The church seems to be collapsing and you're running in. Why? My good friend, Father Tom Sulars, and I used to discuss that all the time. What in the world is attracting these people? And of course, the answer was the same as the answer for every vowed religious in this room and every priest or vowed brother in the church. They were called. They were called. God still speaks. And they answered the call. And, and they went forth to, to proclaim good news. That's, that's our work. That's what we have to focus on. Proclaim the kingdom. Proclaim the kingdom in season and out of season. And we cannot cover up. When it's pointed out, we have to say the truth. I like the story of the priest and the rabbi and the minister who had a game of gin rubby every Friday night and one day they, they were caught gambling and they were brought before the magistrate and the magistrate went to the minister and he says, Reverend, were you gambling? And he looked down and he went, oh God, I'm in trouble. I've got to cover this up somehow. I've got to cover this up. And, and, and so he, he, he said, a little lie, a white lie. And he looked at it and he said, he said uh, no magistrate, I, I wasn't gambling. He went to the priest, Father, were you gambling? The priest says, oh, uh, uh, I, 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 oh, Father, I'm sorry, Father, I've got to cover this up. My congregation will never understand this. I, I will be the shame of my parish. No, no, I, I wasn't gambling. He looked at the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, were you gambling? He didn't look to the left, didn't look to the right. He looked right in the eyes of the magistrate and said, with who? Are you guys going to leave me too? Are you going to leave me too? 
Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. You are eternal life. And so in season and out of season, we will follow you into the kingdom.